on, and I see this preacher, and I knew, I knew in my heart, I knew in my mind, in the whole night, this isn't a man. And then this thing walks across the road, takes a turn towards us, and then leaps over a guardrail. Went to look forward, and there was a big black thing, is all I can To Squatch D TV. Exploring the Bigfoot mystery each week with your hosts, veteran researcher, author, and TV personality, the Squatch Detective, Steve Culls. And from the Bigfoot Research Project of Kentucky, Chris Bennett. Sit back and buckle up as we bring you guests from around North America discussing the Bigfoot phenomena, but not without a few laughs, too. Here are your hosts, Steve and Chris. Good evening, Cyberspace. Welcome to Squatch D TV for today's date, March 14th, 2021. I'm your host, your guide, the Squatch Detective Steve Coles, along with the guy down there, Mr. Chris Bennett. Hello, Chris. Steve, how's it going, man? I, I, I'm about to die from reading some of the comments over there in the chat from ot so far i hope everything's going good in uh, new york tonight it, it is cold again i thought we had broken it but no we're we're back to uh a nice balmy 25 with a wind show oh. about 10 degrees because we got oh, high wind today. oh man so, yeah well it's just now getting to that point where i can actually turn off the heater so I don't require heat or air conditioning at night and that's great because i love saving electricity <laughs> that's right <laughs> don't we but, all uh, Hopefully it's a, it's about gone, you know, this, this winter. I'm ready for spring to start. Well, I was going to say hi to Doug, but Doug blanked out. <laughs> Doug, you can get out of his. There he is. I hit a button. He's here. All right. <laughs> what How you happened? doing? Um, so, well, welcome to our guest, Doug. How are you, sir? Doug. Doug. I'm good. Hey, Chris. So we are going to have some fun tonight. Let's do our usual roll call. And, of course, yeah. uh, if I can get this thing to scroll because everybody is – uh, let me just show you the uh, OT was in here with 94 minutes to go. So hello, OT. Oh, welcome, OT. Thank I'm sorry you. about your cat. <laughs> and uh, B, of course, B is here. Oh, hi, B. Oh, there she is. <laughs> and, of course, we got uh, Keith Keith Worley's in the house. Hello, Keith. Oh, Keith. On hey, guy. What's going on? Of course, our good buddy, Nottingham Yankee from over, over the pond. Nottingham, England. Oh, wow. Welcome. Tom, Tom Conley, hello. Welcome, hello, Tom. Tom. Aaron is in the house. Hey, Aaron. Good to see you. We got Mike in the house. Hi, Mike. And there is Mr. Walt and Little Walt. Walt. Welcome. Big Walt, Little Walt. Welcome, guys. And uh, John, of course, John is in the hey, house. John. And those are the folks that want to talk right now. So, uh, <laughs> who else? Did I miss anybody? Uh, oh, yes. There's. Mr. Jay oh, Bachochin's in Jay. the house. Jay! We found Jay again. Yep. Finding Jay. And, of course, look, 
Uh, Am and Chris is in the house. If I can find oh. his hello, they just stack up. So Am and Chris, hi. Chris. Yep, and he meant to say if I can find the comment. Uh, yep, windows are open in Oklahoma. Ah, up well, and uh, what a, Jesus what a is in the house. Hey, hey, Jesus, what's going on, man? What's going Good on? To see ya. And we got low riders in the house. Low rider. And of course, Sherry's in the house. Hi, Sherry. So. See, we, we, we tell people, hey, we nobody, hardly anybody's checked in. All of a sudden, everybody starts checking in. So, yeah. And, of course, Terry's in the house. Hello, Terry. Hi, Terry. Welcome. So here we are. Good to see you guys. So uh, before we get on to our guest tonight, of course, we always have some news. Um, and and, and this, this kind of has been uh, festering for a little bit for several, well, at least a couple of months about the Oklahoma Bigfoot hunting permits. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they've announced that they're going to, uh, as this legislation goes forward, it hasn't passed yet. Um, but as the legislation goes forward, they're trying a $25,000 bounty for a live, live Bigfoot, not a dead Bigfoot. They make that very clear. And uh, apparently <laughs> the uh, Justin Humphrey, who is the gentleman behind it, I don't know if he's the any relation to uh, Mike Humphrey. Mike Humphrey was remember the siege at Honubi? Mm -hmm, yeah. That whole well, I, I don't know if it's a relation because I think that's uh, same last name. So hard to say. Yeah. I, not not yeah. quite sure. But small uh, world. yeah, yeah, it certainly is. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about being a small world too with the next part uh, about your great uncle, <laughs> which is kind oh, of oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, so I guess. Justin was getting a lot of feedback from people and he wanted to put a video out to say, Hey, what, what this is about. So look, we can play this. We can comment it over it. It's, you know, when we play these links, we can actually talk over it and pause it and do all kinds of neat things. So if anybody's got a question, fire away. Uh oh, Mr. Jimmy tricks in the house. Hello, Jimmy. Welcome Jimmy. So here we go. We're, we're, we're going to play this video. Here it is. This Bigfoot festival there in Honubby starts in October and so what we're trying to do is promote that festival, promote that area, get people to come into that area because we believe if they come to our area, they'll want to come back. They're going to tell their friends. They're going to bring people back again. Now, I, I got I got to stop real quick because somebody, who the heck said that? Where Where is it? Uh Low rider, of course. Uh, you know, low rider, we see here and there, and, and I don't think we've seen him a couple the last couple of weeks. But mm. his sense of humor is pretty good too. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Uh, we don't play politics here, but that no, was, no politics. But, th but that was kind of funny. <laughs> and what we're going to look at is by offering a bounty on Bigfoot. So what we want to try to do is offer a bounty of $25,000 for a real life Bigfoot. We're going to offer the opportunity to buy licenses and buy tags. Now our goal is not to kill Bigfoot. We want to make sure that everybody understands that we're not trying to shoot Bigfoot. What we want to do is trap Bigfoot and that we're offering for those who want to come out and get in a hunt and try to trap Bigfoot, a 25000 This is my goal is to try to get the wildlife department to maybe support a $25,000 bounty on Bigfoot. And that by doing so, we're going to have lots of people come out and want to participate in looking for Bigfoot. I've already been contacted by many, many people who just want to buy a license to frame and put on their wall. And so again, this is one of these things that I think that if uh, everybody will stop for a minute, take a deep breath. Uh, I got a lot of people saying, oh, this is crazy and we shouldn't uh, be involved in this kind of legislation. Guess what? This is tourism. This is a big, big look on, uh, you know, on the media, look on um, the TV and try to find Honey Bigfoot, other shows about Bigfoot. They're all over. Uh, because it's very, very popular. A lot of people are very uh, mesmerized. A lot of people love the Bigfoot um, things. And so, again, to offer this, to come in, to buy a license, to buy a tag, that's going to make revenue for Oklahoma to bring them in to our festival. And, and we're trying to extend that to about a month long uh, so they just don't come during that one little period, but they come 
for the entire month. And when they come, we hope that they experience our lakes, our rivers, our mountains, uh, and that they want to come back and that they want to bring their friends back and that they're going to spend money right there in southeastern Oklahoma in District 19. And there's nothing wrong with taking a little step back, having a good time, enjoying the outdoors. And if you don't like Bigfoot, you don't have to participate, but there's a lot of people who would love to come out, have a day hunting Bigfoot, or take a week and, and get a chance to get out in the woods and get to experience that kind of adventure. And so we wanna invite you to come into southeastern Oklahoma and get to enjoy all the habitat and all the scenery that you can in that, that part of the state. We're gonna make sure that we put language in that we are uh, promoting a live Bigfoot. This is about trapping Bigfoot. This is not about killing Bigfoot. So this is not going to be an issue where we should have people out there running around with guns hunting Bigfoot. This is a, a situation where people who really believe in Bigfoot are out there trying to find evidence of Bigfoot, trying to find does he really exist? And if they want to, they can try to trap a live Bigfoot and get a bounty of $25,000 if we're able to get that kind of legislation passed. <laughs> oh, boy. Tom Conley, another great <laughs> idea. Bat day at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Now, um, uh, this is a plea uh, for help on the tourism, I think. Uh, and you tell me 25 grand is all I can come up with? I mean, come on, people. We're talking about the state of Oklahoma. Well, um, well, maybe we're talking about the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. I, I don't know. 25,000 seems kind of low for a Bigfoot. Don't you think, Doug? <clears throat> it seems extremely low. You would spend that in iron bars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the comments were awesome here. Uh, Bigfoot Society. Welcome, oh. welcome. Said is yeah. an SNL sketch. I, I, I don't know. Um, well, it, it's insane. Yeah, it, it is a bit on the insane side. Why not just promote Bigfoot and get a phone Bigfoot hunting permit or something? Well, you know, have a festival or do something, but the whole thing is just because I thought before they were offering a tag for a shoot, you wow. know, shoot one, and now they've yeah. changed it. Yeah, and, and they said that they're even going to give you a tag for a Bigfoot, but right. you're not going to shoot one. Well, uh, you know, uh, just the, the name, a Bigfoot hunting license, that implies hunting, you know, and usually people do that with a gun. Now, if, now he's talking about trapping. I mean, I don't know about Oklahoma, but in Kentucky, we have hunting licenses, fishing licenses, and trapping licenses. Yeah. So they should uh, they should offer a Bigfoot trapping license. Hey, Steve, are you, are you thinking leg hold? Or what <laughs> I, would imagine, I would imagine you want in on this. <laughs> yeah, well, you're Chris, a little... Chris is thinking rope, <laughs> foot snares, maybe. I'm thinking, I'm thinking that just I'll just get them and put them in the figure four leg lock, get them to submit. Well, uh, you didn't <laughs> mention that you had to bring him in uninjured. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Where's the Bigfoot's arms? As Where's long as it's a little bit alive, apparently. <laughs> oh no! And Bill Brock says I'm using grenades. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> grenades, anything. Yeah. Oh, that's um, terrible. Yeah, I mean, uh, Aaron, Aaron's made a good point. Aaron, Aaron Malikov uh, made a good point. He, he says this is just dangerous as hell. You know. Yes. You know. Come on, this is. Yes. No, no offense, Chris. This is the South. Yeah, this is not going to end well. <laughs> Somebody's going to get it's the really idea. Not. Hey, you know what? I don't care. Let's say we got to bring him alive. We're going to bring him in one way or the other. And well, you know, it is a good thing that, you know, he's, he's coming out and saying, we're not talking to, we don't want to shoot Bigfoot because, you know, there's going to be hoaxers there and they're going to be uh, with the, the $20 gorilla suit from Halloween running around the woods. Okay. Somebody is going to get shot regardless whether he says, we don't want to shoot Bigfoot. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's going to be people there that, uh, that do now, want now, to shoot he's Bigfoot. Not, he's not here yet, but he'll come in late. But we have the perfect <laughs> Bigfoot bait that will take down a Bigfoot. Not necessarily kill him. Not in a small dose. That's It's X's meatloaf. But, oh, yeah. but guys, for, for fun, you need to start using your imagination. What would you do? 
Steve. What hmm. would you do, Chris? So I'm just saying, just just let's say it was 25 million. I would. Hmm. What would you do? Come on, guys. Um, I would. Net. What could we bait them with? That would that would be you know we we, we have uh, not a Yankee says apples full of sleeping tablets. Eh, not bad, mm. not bad. I think uh, I I think we should uh, bait them with you know we should get one of those uh, you know how they have the robo deer to catch poacher. <laughs> we'll, we'll put a robo bigfoot out there. You know, you know it could work. It could oh, man. They're, they're using that for gorillas. Yeah, yeah little, it's a little. Little little gorilla pheromone around yeah, the no, uh, around right. the the robo squatch, yep. and uh, yeah, it may, it may hang a piece of beef jerky out of their mouth. And uh, hey, I think I saw that on an episode of Monster Quest that the pher pheromone chips they were hanging out of. <laughs> yeah, they 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 even have like Chris. Chris, is, Chris has been awful quiet. Cool. <laughs> what are your ideas, Chris? Yeah. What, oh, what, what, gee, I don't know. You know. <laughs> I, what what I had thought about the, the only way to catch one alive would be to uh, dart it, and it's going to have to be. Of course, you're going to have to have a sighting first, and you're also going to have a uh, a dart gun, tranquilizer gun, and uh, you're going to have to hope that the tranquilizer will take effect before he or she gets to you. <laughs> well, you know. He, so so my point is, somebody needs to pressure them mm. to release all of the exceptions and all of their rules. Right. What's left, you know, uh, right. a, you know, a fishing net. Yeah. I mean, not just the whole thing. It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's the I mean, if, King if Kong is, syndrome. Well, you know, yeah. the, you know, maybe maybe we get some ketamine. Can you know, they'll they'll have to remove it from the bars and, and send it up to over to us. But well, you know, they say trapping now. You know, what are the guys thinking? Are they thinking bear traps? You know, you clamp one on his leg, and then that's going to be somebody, some other Bigfoot researcher or, or some tourist out there. Get stuck in a bear trap. One thing that will be accomplished that that gentleman will get his 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's for sure gonna happen. Yeah, and uh, somebody somebody made a comment of a slab of ribs from Walmart, and that reminded me. Remember the slab of ribs from Walmart, Chris? Oh, yeah, yeah. that yeah. was that was the Rick Dyer tent video. <laughs> oh, I got my uh, right. So yeah. today, this this yeah. actually popped up in my my memories today and it was Rick Dyer in the Holy Grail. <laughs> somebody made this for me. And then of course, somebody also put this on the bottom here. Marvelous Lee Zadie humor, Steve Coles. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I thought that. that was pretty funny. Pretty um, but uh, yeah, sometimes uh, some of the things that pop up in my, my feed just make me shake my head. But uh <clears throat> So anyway, let's let's get on to tonight's guest. And of course, before we get on to that, we're going to, of course, w without any introduction, this is the man responsible for these types of things. And we're going to play a little intro to my favorite Monster Quest episode there. Here it is. And there we have it. Yeah. Gee, Steve, why did you pick that episode? <laughs> I, I have no <laughs> idea. Yeah. <laughs> I... You know, it, it was full of excitement. Actually, it's full of, of a, a couple of my favorite favorite people. Yep. Uh, not myself, but uh, of course, the late great Dan Gordon. Yeah, Dan was wasn't he a lovely guy? He was he was just marvelous. And uh, may I, I'll relay a story that you may not know, but uh, I was at a table and Bill Bram was my mentor for many years. Oh, so really? another one of my favorite. Yep. Good so he, here I'm at a table with Bill. And uh, Brian Goslin is there. Of course, he yeah, was the other police Brian officer in 76. Uh, and Dan Gordon was there. And, you know, Brian was telling his story for the for the table. There's a few other people there. And um, then Dan was telling his story. And then when he got done, he looked over at, 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 at Brian. And he goes, and I thought you were crazy. And it was just the funniest moment when, when, when Dan told him that. And uh, that's just a moment that uh, mm. just can't you know you you'll yeah. never see again unfortunately yeah. but um dan was always big into the whitehall sasquatch festival that they were trying the calling festival and stuff and i remember going down there they had a pumpkin launch which was hysterical they had all these trebuchets and they were launching pumpkins into the canal <laughs> um i remember i remember something that happened really weird in whitehall oh 
I don't know how it exactly went down, but I ended up being left at the Whitehall police station and I was, I was manning the whole station. <laughs> and I was on the phone with Brad Steiger. I was doing a radio interview with uh, on coast to coast with Brad Steiger. I'm now apparently guarding the whole police station I'm in charge of it. I'm the dispatcher or whatever, because everybody had to leave. And I don't know why they had to leave. I just, I can't remember, but it was just, it was surreal. <laughs> like ring. Should I answer it? Oh, police department. <laughs> Oh, nine one one. What are you reporting? Yeah, exactly. And you know, the whole thing is, we were there to do the, you know, the reenactment. Yeah. And yeah. um, got it. It's just such a cool town. That that uh, that that truly is a Family Guy moment. <laughs> and one well, more story I've got to tell now because I can't tell it later. Sure. So we were doing a reenactment, and I put this guy. He needed to shake the bush at a certain time. You know, when Brian was seeing this uh, creature. And so we put him in the bush and I forgot he was in the bush. <laughs> he just totally forgot about him. And it was like two hours later, he yells out, Doug, Doug, can I come out of the bush? There's a creature in here. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think something an hour ago. <laughs> Oh man. True story. Oh my god. The guy was just, you know, what a saint. He just sat in that bush. That is funny. Of course. First cue. The the <laughs> reenactment stuff that was done on uh that was originally Mysterious Encounters, was it? Oh that? yeah. Yep. Right. That's what I'm thinking about. Yep. And that was on the Outdoor Life Network, and it preceded yeah. by a couple of years, uh Monster Quest. Yep. And uh I think Monster Quest got a lot of major exposure because it was on the history channel, and that really yep. Got it, you know. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh I remember because it was mysterious encounters. Dan was thinking about coming forward, but I didn't, but he didn't. Right. So we stuck with Brian. And then through the years, Dan said, What the heck? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna come forward. Yep. I mean, he really that was a big that was a big important thing in his life. Yep. Uh yeah, uh it was. And uh I, I <laughs> part of it was having that heart the first heart attack he had back then because he didn't think he was gonna live. Yeah. And then he decided, you know, heck, I'm I'm just going to come forward. And uh yeah, he truly was a beautiful guy. I mean, uh you know, he he was so caring about everybody else. Did and, did you guys ever have Dan share with you that when that creature crossed in front of his car, it was emaciated? I, he may have said that. Um I don't think we, he ever said it publicly. Yeah, I, years ago. I mean, he may have told me that privately. I don't know if he said it publicly. We we had him on the show years ago. Um, of course, I never really pressed him to come on too many times because I knew he was, you know, and he would get very emotional about telling that story. Yeah, yeah, he um, did. Uh, I remember he was at the last. Uh, he was at a Finding Bigfoot Town Hall. I think maybe a year before his death, maybe even six months before his death in in uh, Fairhaven, Vermont. And uh, I remember he was telling everybody, and he, you could see, hear his voice trembling as he's telling that story now. Always so emotional. Um, yeah, I, I, I miss the guy. W one of my favorites, though, in that, that, um, in that whole thing, and I never got to, to meet them. I mean, of course, not only did we lose um, Dan Gordon, but we lost uh, John Bindernagel. Um, yes. Dr. John, yeah. wonder, wonderful guy too, and uh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I remember putting my cast in front of him, and I was like, "Going well, now's the moment of truth." And he looked at, it, he says, "No, this is this is right for what it's supposed to be." Yeah. And I was like, Whew. "You know, <laughs> okay, it's good." <laughs> um, but well, another, I think it was really cool that John got to go to New York, you know, the other side of the the world, and meet all you guys, because I don't think he would have ever done that otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, why? They've got so much going on in Vancouver yeah. Island. Why would he come to New York? Right. Among places. But it was cool. He did. It opened his mind up. Yeah. Uh, and, and he certainly would. And uh, we got the impression he was certainly impressed. Like, wow, they, they really are out here. You know? Yeah. 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 You know? um, you know, of course, I love Kurt Kogut, who is the guy from NCON. Well, and, and it's funny because. Um, Mike Wafer, wonderful director. Um, actually, you know, I the, the the clips he put in were like, wow, I can really get at that one because 
Colgate made a statement like, if these things were real, people would be seeing them. And I was like, what? What the kind of statement is that? Yeah, I've <laughs> yeah. heard that too many times. And uh, the other one was uh, I Philip. Go, I always go, well, they do constantly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and, and then there was uh, Philip Stevens who said, um, you know, there's no evidence that, you know, North American can support a large primate. And I'm going, wait a minute, we're large primates. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> so it, it was always like, okay, Mike, Mike had the perfect voice clips in there because they weren't, you know, really condemning. They were just opinions. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, but so tell us how did this all start for you? You're talking about Monster Quest or interest in Bigfoot? Oh, uh, let's, let's start with the interest in Bigfoot. We start at the beginning. Huh? Okay. Well, you know, like everybody, I started out, first time I'd heard about it was seeing the Patterson Gimlin, you know, creature on okay. the cover of a magazine at the library. And I remember kind of that three-second rule where we all grew up looking at really bad, crappy costumes, you know, and shows like Lost in Space and whatever, just the movies. Costumes looked horrible. But when I saw that, I went, oh, my God, that's not a costume. I remember almost instantly seeing that because I could notice right away the, the tendon under the leg, you know, and just little details. And, and so as a young kid, I just knew it was real. Um, and so I was interested, but that kind of gets put in the back of your mind because obviously there's no Bigfoots in Minnesota. You know, it's nothing I'm ever going to deal with, and it's really cool. And this mystery will be solved. Flash forward, um, the first time I went deer hunting up in northern Minnesota, I was sitting at my stand before the sun came out, and a big, um, loud uh, noise, which sounded like chest beating to me, happened. And then I got hit with a big stink, you know, big uh, kind of a, I don't know, it was an odor, definitely smelled like rotten meat, you know, wet dog, you know, the same kind of descriptions you hear. Oh. And it hit me, and I was like covered up my, you know, my face um, with a scarf. And then I heard the chest beating come closer, and it was distinctly chest beating. It was not a grouse. But then you're, it went away, and I'm back to deer hunting again. We went, we went, met back in camp. Every single deer hunter had the exact same story. Wow. Whatever it was was mobile and went from person to person, and our stands were about you know, quarter to a half a mile apart. And that really got me. And I kind of went, oh, <laughs> what are the chances? What else can do a chest beat? So then flash forward, um, I was up at uh, uh, Selwyn Lake up in the Northwest Territories, kind of in the, you know, in the Arctic region, regions. Ooh. And I was up there with a biologist and up there with some other people. And we had, st we were up there trying to get footage of a, of a, a giant lake trout, which has never been listed as a crypto creature, but I had seen one. You know, six feet long. If you can imagine a trout six feet long, Oof. saw it with my own eyes as it chased um, like a 30 pound trout I was reeling in. So I was back up there trying to get footage of one of these crazy things. And we had to go to the restroom. So we stopped on shore and there's footprints on the shore and they're coming out of the water. You know, the water was real shallow. There's a ton of islands. Something had either visited one of the islands, had walked, had walked right out of the water, right up into the pea gravel, into the, um, you know, the, the lichen and moss that was there. Mm -hmm. And so we could follow these tracks. And then, so here's where it really got me, guys. I see a footprint in front of a tree trunk, and I see a footprint behind the tree trunk in a perfectly straight line. Whatever it was, walked over the tree. Now, that's something you don't, you know, you don't think about or hear about, but this tree was seven foot tall. And so it just walked over it like you would walk over a weed. Yeah. And that's when the people I was with actually just said, we should probably get back to the boat, get out of here. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like right out of a movie, that whole scene, you know, with these people there and seeing this, knowing, and we were all, in, you know, we were all wildlife um, experts to a point. Um, I knew bear tracks. I knew they weren't polar bear. I knew they weren't grizzly. They weren't double step. They were human right. footprints. But here, here we get out. 
I said, no, let's, let's see where these tracks go. So we get on the other side of this small stand of trees, and there's footprints going off into the horizon in a straight line off on the tundra. And so that's what I came back from that trip, and I wanted answers. I mean, I started calling everybody I knew. And, in fact, I called one of the people I called eventually was Matt Moneymaker. And Matt, you know, Matt, and he was just, you know, these things are all over, woods, water, and hills, you know. And they're not that rare. And, yeah, they're up in Alaska. They're, in, you know, up in the Arctic. And I just went, you're kidding me. So this isn't something that weird. So, no, I mean, it's, you know, uncommon but common. And so we, we just, you know, we became friends. And he, you know, educated me um, on all of the things that we do know or think we know. And uh, that's what happened. We set out to produce a show, Legend Meet Science which we succeeded in, you know, what well, I love that. That was, yeah. you know, years, my, my favorite, it still is my favorite yeah. uh, that's out there because it's, well, it's still relevant. It's still yeah. totally relevant. And it's been, you know, 20, 20 some years. Yeah. yeah. It's still highly relevant because we still don't have a body. There's still people arguing whether this is real or that's real. There's still a ton of new people growing up that don't know anything. They just go as, like, are there more? I get asked questions like, are there more than one? Yeah. Oh. And no. so the most basic um, science is covered in Legend Meet Science. And, of course, became a book. And then after that, um, I sold a series called The Mysterious Encounters that you mentioned. Um, yeah. And that turned into me pitching a show on Giganto, The Real King Kong. About right. Black. Right. Yeah. That ended up being a big hit on history. And I remember, you know, getting a call like the next day going, Can you make more of these? Yeah. yeah. And of course, <laughs> I immediately said, Yes. Certainly. <laughs> no, I, I remember just saying that one word. I said, Yes. And I waited for them to talk. And they told me why. And, and the next thing you know, I was signing a contract for Monster Quest. Wow. So. Well, you know, that answers a lot of questions for me because <laughs> I always wondered, how does Doug make an uh, extra great uh, show and then I can watch another show that somebody else did and it's like, eh, so-so. Yeah. And uh, I would always wondered if you'd had some sort of experience or an encounter before well, and now I know. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, so you got, I think what you're picking up on is the passion. Yeah. It's the fact yeah. that I care. Right. I'm interested. I want answers. So when we go do a monster quest, I can't do everything in, in a show because it's only 40 yeah. minutes, you know. Right. But I can at least get every show can raise the bar a tiny bit. Can get some answer, something yeah. tested. Like in that show that Steve played, mm -hmm. got to do a lie detector test on a policeman. Yeah. It had never yeah. been done. So there you go. I raised the bar a tiny bit. You know, we didn't solve the mystery, but we raised it a little bit. Right. So everything I do, I try to raise the bar. And that's that's really all anybody can hope. But I was a, a wildlife um, researcher and a producer of wildlife shows before I got into the crypto world. Mm -hmm. And so I just got passionate about, you know, the, um, you know, the Bigfoot topic and other crypto topics because I realized they're, you know, People are not making this stuff up. You know, when they see something, I tend to believe them because every time I've thought a story was bogus or no, it just can't be, I've been put in my place really quick by my own encounter, you know. Okay. And yeah. so it's very humbling and I'm just passionate and I'm really, really hoping I get to do more, which I'm working on really hard right now. Oh, man, that would be great. Yeah, I yeah. would love to see a whole new series come out, Doug. <laughs> I guarantee. I'm working on it. In fact, I'm working on it with some very high-powered people, and I'm I'm hoping you know that we can make it happen. Doesn't mean it will. Stuff's always a long shot, yeah. but uh, I you know like my whole day was full of looking at things and talking to people, and you know just right. kind of moving up the ladder. So yeah. here here's my question to you is. 
has has a platform, and this is completely not on the big. This is more an industry question. Is the the discovery platform now is a subscriber based yep. um, platform versus uh, a a platform that was advertisement based. So is that going to open? Do you think that opens the field a little bit more and makes it easier, provided the programming is is good to get onto it uh, onto a discovery network? Sure. Or? Sure. Well, here here's what I think exactly is going to happen. This is this is not my guess. I know this is what's going to happen. Right now, some of the streaming platforms have, um, let's say, less than professional shows on. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 If you've seen at the least, at the Be least, kind. <laughs> so it's kind of open, it's kind of a free for all right now. Um, but that's going to change and, and they're going to get they're going to tighten up on it. I even think that even YouTube eventually will stop at some point, we'll just stop taking amateur whatever that's going to have to be, you know, professionally produced. Um, like this show. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say, Steve? So like this show. Yeah, like this show. Um, no. But 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 what's gonna happen is just kind of this evolution where right now it's a free for all in streaming, but I think it's gonna tighten up. I think streaming will be more prestigious than network, and network is obviously their audiences are shrinking. But those broadcast places are now opening up streaming. Yeah. Services. So, you yeah. know, a slow transition. CBS plus Peacock and uh, yeah, they're all. So if an amateur is wants to get into the field, get in now. Yeah. Because the doors will close again. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Doug, you're a, uh, the, Steve had his favorite episode of Monster Quest. Okay. Yeah. For some reason. And I have my favorite episode for some this, reason. This is the part where I mute Chris. <laughs> and uh, Chris, he's probably going to be mad at me. But uh, Is your episode that's favorite? Are you in it? Uh, no, 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 no. I, I don't do TV or, or stuff like that. Right. No, no. But uh, no, my favorite episode has to do with the Kentucky episode. Oh. And it was called The Hillbilly Beast. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've always wanted to ask. And don't take this the wrong way, but no. whose idea was it to name the Bigfoot Kentucky episode Not Billy me. Beast? Not <laughs> me. I was still, in fact, you know, I fight battles. You fight battles with the network. Yeah, I yeah. fought that one, and I still lost. Because <laughs> think about it from my my perspective. I'm I'm into science. Right. I'm into integrity, and when I heard that, I went through the roof. <laughs> I mean, I literally went through the roof, but I'm well, dealing. But I'm dealing with people, you know, network execs in New York. Yeah, yeah. And to them, that's the you know that's their 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 um, area that they either feel they can make fun of or whatever. Yeah. To me, I was actually <laughs> even I was offended by that. Well, you know, I I did think that was kind of funny, and it's not offensive. I mean, if. To people from Kentucky, it's not offensive. Well, but to just, me, it was only because they're dim diminishing what we were trying to do by the title. Because yeah. it's playing, you know, it's it isn't doing anybody any favors. But yeah, it wasn't me, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but Still but Doug, my Doug, you got to know the people, and I know Chris, Chris. Chris and I go one another one, every once in a while. But but you got to understand, I know people from Kentucky. They're like. Hillbilly Beast? Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's, there's hillbillies here. From, that, oh, from, from what the stereotype is of people. But to me, those that title was just totally didn't belong in that show. Should have been the yeah. Kentucky, you know, just yeah. the state. Uh, it's okay, man. I, I am a self-proclaimed hillbilly from Kentucky. The, the Hillbilly Beast there's nothing wrong with it. actually <laughs> sounds like but a Chris, title. You probably Mount don't like someone calling you that, though. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. I don't mind it. Here, here's, here was what I loved about that show. That show actually has got some really weird things that actually happened. Yeah. Of them burying it, this mm -hmm. this creature, this dog, and then it gets dug up again and put back. That was there were things on that show that to me really got to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the uh, let's see, well, the sound clip. Uh, that uh, 
oh my gosh, what was his name from uh, Texas A&M? Uh, Dr. Robert he, Benson. Robert, he, he got a sound clip, Robert and I was like, oh, yeah. cool. Oh, no, it was Benson's partner, uh, Fox. Oh, okay, Fox. Fox. Yes, Fox. Yeah. Awesome show. Loved yeah, every minute of it. He actually um, got somewhat, I think, interested in the topic after he heard that firsthand and couldn't ID yeah. it. Yeah, that's got to blow some people's minds. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you read Legend Meet Science, you know, uh, Doc Meldrum's book, you know, it, 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 you know, how many scientists did he, that got interested because of like, hey, this is like Darius Swindler and, and, and people like that going, hey, what, what you know, what the, the, the school can, this is not an elk lay, you know, so. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I remember, you know, I mean, Darius was a pretty, prestigious scientist yep. i mean he wrote the he wrote the anatomy the comparative anatomy between apes and humans hmm. if you go to college to study human ape anatomy humans and ape anatomy you're going to be reading his books right right and the atlas and to have him look me in the eye towards the end of his life and go these things are real and there's things that only i know that told me that based on dimensions of tendons and little things that he picked up, you know, from the Skookum cast. It's just yes. it's absolutely amazing. It was a stunning moment for me. Yeah. It's, it's the, when you, you know, I, you know, and I tell people if, if you haven't read uh, Dr. Meldrum book, which is a beautiful companion to the documentary. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. You know, it, it just opens your eyes to the science of it all. Um you know, the, the, the tendon size comparisons and, you know, the, you know, and I remember talking with uh, Jeff at a dinner sometime talking to him, you know, what's, what's the, he goes, my, my biggest thing. And this is something that, and, and this is something that he didn't even put in his book, which I really found. He goes, you know, when an elk, he goes, when an elk get, is laying down and it gets up, the first thing it does is defecates. And he goes, there was no elk droppings in the cast. So yeah. it, obviously if it was laying there and it gotten up, it would have defecated. Yeah, I still hear that to this day. It was elk legs. And I'm still like, they don't realize that we actually got elk legs, you yeah. know, from a butcher and tested every which way from Sunday to try to duplicate those prints. They could not be duplicated, period. It's not, it's not maybe they were close. No, they just couldn't even come close with elk legs. Mm -hmm. The Skookum cast is a cast of some very large. Humanoid figure, period. Uh, it, you know, and, and the, to hear Jeff break it all down in that book. And see, I, I not only do I have the, the print book, but I got the audible book, too, because I like listening to it in the car. It's better absorbing to me that way. Um, so if anybody out there, I, I can't recommend that enough, too. If you not only have the print book, get the audible copy. Is uh, and, Dr. And, Meldrum narrate that, or is it somebody else? Somebody else did. Okay. Yeah. Somebody else did, but um, uh, but it's it's still an excellent, you know, it, it you know, it doesn't matter who's now, it was narrating his words, so it was like him talking. And the funny thing is, is I've heard you know, Dr. Jeff talk so many times that yeah, you know, I'm, I'm listening to the guy and I'm just picturing Jeff's voice in it. So, I uh, think if I ever do a book, I'm gonna have my audio book narrated by James Earl Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like you would my, good li it. my life in Kentucky use the force um, anyway uh, <clears throat> I was, was so pleased when that book came out based on you know my documentary I mean that it was just you have no idea how that made my year when that book finally came out it was yeah. amazing um, yeah it was kind of yeah. funny because uh, before I, I had actually uh, known uh, Dr. Jeff um I, uh, you know, he had this book signing. So I, I brought my copy there and he had all the, 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 it was all soft cover books. He had, I had the only hardcover because I bought it the day it came out. Yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I don't even have one. Huh? Yeah. I really? Cover new. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but one of the mo more interesting, uh, mysterious encounters to me was the Louisiana, episode where the creature got hit by the car yeah yeah that was really interesting oh, you thought that was was awesome 
You know what was really, I, I would have never known about that case if it wasn't for the brother meeting the brother of the ambulance driver. Oh, so if I wouldn't have met him, I would have never heard about that case. Right. And, oh, I got, man, I got a lot of backstories on that, you know, on that show. Um, I mean, everything from being threatened um, to not show the faces of some people, um, like of the, you know, the, the, the tracking dog team that actually went out there and couldn't catch this, whatever it was that was hit by that car. Yeah. Dogs would catch up to it, and the thing would outrun the dogs. Yeah. Yeah, it's just absolutely amazing. So you actually got threatened out there. <laughs> I did. Doesn't, yeah. Yeah, sure. it doesn't surprise. Yeah, people don't understand some of you know. Uh, I I think a threat has only come my way once, and I was like, "Relax, dude." I'm not. <laughs> when yeah. I say threatened, I mean like, yeah, I felt like, oh God, don't, you know, that they they weren't joking because. Yeah. Yeah. They were helping me out, but they did not want their names or faces associated with it. If they were the team that actually chased this thing. Wow. Now, and and the blood evidence was lost on that, wasn't it? Yeah. It, uh, it, it, it often is. Um, it's so weird, you know, because nobody ever thinks of collecting it. Yeah. There was a case just here in Texas where there was a, a Bigfoot that was shot. I mean, everything's been pretty well vetted. Um, there was even a sheriff involved. But the driveway, just so happens, was scheduled to be rocked. Oh, geez. And the driveway got rocked. Wow. But it wasn't a huge amount of blood, but there was blood there. What are we going to do? Pull the entire driveway up now to try yeah. to get at, you know, to try to find a small pool of blood. Well, yeah, I, I noticed on a lot of the shows, Doug, you have, uh, you know, uh, stories, uh, encounters that had not been uh, published, you know, anywhere else. Stuff that I'd never heard of before, mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed to me you know, I was experiencing this for the first time. Yeah, and I was wondering, do, do you like do your own groundwork, or do you got other people looking mm -hmm. research for you to no, find these? Yeah, you know, well, generally, generally, in most of the shows, I did the groundwork, most of it. But I also, there were other shows where I would have help, you know, if it was on a Thunderbird, right. for instance. I would get them started with everybody I knew. Yeah. And I would say, here's a lead, here's a, you know, and then they would have to do it on their own. Uh, here's a here's a question in the in the chat, too, is like, Doug, what was your favorite episode? Did you have a favorite episode? Not really. Um, I had some I didn't like. <laughs> But I won't mention that. Um, yeah, the, the Bigfoot in New York one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my favorite was the Bigfoot in New York. There was a guy uh, named Steve Calls. <laughs> that's my favorite. I just go completely opposite. Yeah, that one I didn't care for. Too. <laughs> Actually, you know what, though? That one was because I knew Dan very well, extremely well. You know, it wasn't just some, it was, this was a guy I talked to on the phone often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew him well. I knew Brian Goslin. I knew Paul um, Bartholomew. I knew all these people. I knew the history well. I had done research in Whitehall. You know, um, I had an experience in Whitehall. Did you really? Oh, absolutely. Oh, let's hear about it. Oh, um, uh, okay. We were we love back talking. in the swamp, literally, um, in Whitehall. And we were in a swamp, and we got in that swamp, um, this forested swampy area through using an amphibious, amphibious vehicle, you know, with the six wheels. Mm -hmm. And oh, so, yeah. I was, yeah, I was driving, and and we had, um, God, I remember everything about that night, but I remember Autumn was in the in the vehicle, and it was Vladimir, Brian was in the back, Brian Goslin, he was with, and uh, Vladimir, myself, Autumn, Goslin, I think that was it. But we were broadcasting, we were in the middle of the forest, in a swamp and we had gone through a lot of water to get in there. Um, and we broadcasted a certain coyote call, right? And this coyote call was uh, more of a, it sounded like pups, I guess, to me, as I remember, a young coyote, mm -hmm. but we heard a chest beat off in the distance, which to me is rare. 
to hear that kind of response. You know, most people will report a wood knock or they'll report, you know, a scream or something. Very seldom do you get a, a reported chest beat. But this one particular call has gotten chest beats, right? <laughs> it's just this one call. I don't know why. Is it territorial? Is it, um, you know, just something that just gets them going? But you get a chest beat. So anyhow, so this chest beat, chest beat got closer. Every time we would do a call, we'd wait. You know, you'd wait your 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And every time it would do a return chest beat, it would be closer until the last time it was right on top of us. And that's, as I remember, one of my crew members started almost getting teary-eyed of, with fear. Right? And I know I, everybody was nervous. I was too. And we were in the dark. Remember, we have no flashlights on. It's just pitch black. And it gets unnerving. And I think the bravest person in the uh, ATV or the, you know, the swamp buggy was Autumn. Yeah, that Autumn, doesn't surprise me. She was the bravest person in that swamp buggy. Yeah, she's pretty, she can be pretty fearless at times. Uh, more questions popping in. Wow. Uh, Em and Chris Great says, story. did anyone ever look further into the Snellgrove DNA? Well, we did it twice um, and it was never done a third time. And to this day, I've got some letters out asking, do you still have our samples, some of the flesh, which was a, quite a bit of it we collected. I've not had one person write me back because uh, I want to get a hold of it now. Yeah, and especially DNA has come so uh, far. Yes, oh, yes. Night and day. It's basically like saying comparing an iPhone to a car, you know, one of the old-fashioned car phones back in the yeah. 70s. The brick. Yeah, the brick. <laughs> That's I exactly where it's coming. Yep. I did too. I did too, Chris. No. Or, or the, the handset attached to the cinder block. Yes. <laughs> Looks like a World War II walkie-talkie telephone thing. Oh yeah. Oh yep. yeah. Yep. Um, Those are cool. Well, I would like to see a show on that uh, with the uh, like a revisit to the Snell Grove DNA. That that would be that would be I a wanna, big. Well, he everybody can write into history because I want to get back there and actually right. do it number three. Yeah. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of new ideas and things that can be done. I mean, back then we didn't have drone technology even. Yeah. That was yeah. just something that people don't realize. There's a lot of new yeah. tools to this day. Tons I mean, FLIRs were as prevalent. Uh, the, right. the, the digital night vision, which is far superior. You can get a, a Gen 1 digital night vision that is good as almost a Gen 3 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. 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 Um, you know that just the the and the the e dna collection stuff although that's pricey right now but i think you know five years down the road six years down the road that's going to be a lot cheaper then well um, well dna is is advanced in both getting you know stuff that's been degraded um yep. and what they can get out of it you know yes. yep. and the amplifiers that they have it's really changed um I literally had a conversation today with a geneticist and the um, artificial intelligence databases that are getting combined with the genealogy, which is probably a burning question in everybody's mind. What is this thing related to? You know, it's got to be related to something. What is it? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, uh, I think OT said something about, uh, he's talking to Ammon Chris, but he said he was interested if that tree was standing up right as well. Uh, I assume that's one that uh, Doug saw the tracks. Uh, that was an upright tree. Oh, I yes. Oh, about seven you. foot tall. Yes. Doug. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it was, upright. A, it was a stunted, upright, growing, yeah. probably a hundred year old stunted spruce tree up yeah. there in the Arctic. We were right on the tree line, literally. So you can you you go any farther north, there are no trees. And so you get it you get it to the point of the transition, you know, the transition line. Yeah. And the trees are getting stunted, small. They could be 150 years old and only be three foot tall. Because of the, you know, the cold and the growing season is so short. And so right there, if anybody wants to look, it's Selwyn Lake in the Northwest Territories. 
And it would basically be north east of Uranium City, which has been abandoned, long abandoned. So even even the natives don't live up there anymore. There's nobody living up there. Wow. Well, it's abandoned. That uh, that brings me back. It takes me back uh, to the first time that I saw tracks in Kentucky. I mean, that were very prevalent, pristine tracks. Yep. Uh, and it was by accident. Uh, my dad and I, he, he, he raised tobacco and I would help him. And the plants grow five to six feet high when they're ready to be cut. Now uh, we were out there cutting, you know, rows of tobacco. And uh, that's where I first saw uh, a track. And uh, this thing, uh, he did not, it did not walk down the row. It walked across the row which meant it was stepping over the top of the tobacco as it walked or maybe leaning it over a little bit because yeah. uh, if you and I were to walk through uh, between the rows, I mean, uh, we would break all the leaves off and then th that's why you grow tobacco for the leaves. Right. But uh, yeah, that, that <clears throat> stepping over the top of that seven foot tree, that seems uh, that really brought back some memories. Well, if, if Bergman's law, which is the law that, the farther you go north, a certain species will get bigger. Right. You know, the white tailed deer in Minnesota are way bigger in te than, than in Texas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just because they need the body mass to stay warm. Well, if Bergman's law has any effect and these things do not migrate, that thing could have been, a, you know, 10 foot tall. Right. You know, if we've got eight foot tall ones in Minnesota, maybe it was a 10 foot tall because. That's almost how big I thought it was, you know, in order to step over a tree like that. Right. I mean, yeah, the tree is, the tree is flexible, but it wasn't broken. Right. Hmm. Uh, next question is from Tack asking, uh, uh, what's the status of the face and handprints project? Um, it's progressing. <laughs> <laughs> Progressing. Um, Tough question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm doing right now is collecting um, sebum or the, you know, the substance that's left behind when humans or apes, because I'm almost at this point pretty convinced that the sebum from like gorillas is, is equally waxy and white. So I'm waiting to get a sample of that. So everything it takes, you know, it takes time. Um, getting getting prices from people that can analyze the collected Alba vernix, which is you know the name we gave this <clears throat> white waxy substance to, which I'm not sure everybody even knows what it is. But for years everybody's been saying, oh, it left you know these big white or dusty, everybody said dusty fingerprints on my windshield, on my camper, you know, it can be from campers or whatever on, on our window. It's eight, you know, it's uh, eight foot up in the air, but there's a big dusty handprint. And for years, I'm like everybody has been seeing these photos. And finally it hit me one day and I went, Oh, I don't think that's dust because there's a man here in Minnesota, Randy who's doing some research and he, you know, he had mentioned this white stuff, but the weird thing is he mentioned, he goes, stuff's not wiping off. It wasn't coming off. And that's when I realized it wasn't dust, but just a substance, you know. And if you, all but just means white. Uh, vernix is like the uh, the waxy coating that babies are born with. Mm -hmm. protect them. So if, if you think about a, 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 a human or a hominid type animal living out in the forest, it's going to need skin protection. Yes. You no. Know? Yeah. Gorillas um, need skin protection. Apes of any type are going to need it, and they do. Um, you know, in a, in a thicker in a, in a thicker sebum. But the cool thing is, there's going to be chemical differences, guys, between human sebum and oil than these things, which means. Since we don't have gorillas in North America, don't you think it's going to raise the bar a whole lot? Right. I sure if, do. one, we have the morphology of the hand, 
the sweat pores, the, the, the dermal ridges. Okay. So we got that. That's tough to fake. You know, how do you fake a hand crease? Yeah. All the little, all the little uh, uh, lines. Okay. Yeah. So now we collect DNA. Okay. So let's human like, let's say that just, let's say DNA isn't advanced as much and it's just human like. Okay, fine. So, all right, we'll give you that one. But now it comes back with a certain molecular structure that only gorillas have. Okay, now how do you explain that? That I'm collecting, that a scientist can get a call in the middle of the night and go collect gorilla sebum of somebody's car? Yeah. Really? You're going to tell me you can do that six times in a year all over the country from different people, and this thing doesn't exist. So that's where... <laughs> Be a real bar raiser. No, yep. and the fact, and, and the fact so that they, and the fact they can get eDNA now from fingerprints, which is you know scary for the criminal world. You oh, know, sure. you, you can't get away with nothing now if you know, <laughs> your DNA is on file. Well, if their wax is as sticky as I believe it is, it's going to have a whole bunch of skin cells in there yep. that are going to be sloughed off. Yep. Well, Doug, that's genius level thinking there because uh, that's absolutely correct. I agree a hundred percent. They're going to need something. If they're living in the forest, they're going to need something on their skin to help protect the skin against bacterial and uh, fungal growth. Right. Uh, and uh, mosquitoes, bugs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, 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 and just to break it down for anybody that didn't quite understand that is like, just put your fingertips on, on a mirror. And take them off, and you can see the smudges there. That comes yep. from the oils of your fingers yep. and hands, and that's what we're talking about here. Is that if, yeah. if, the other really yeah. interesting thing is that our sebum is very acidic, right? Mm -hmm. yep. I have personally seen a number of reactions with their sebum on plastic. It etches. Wow. Okay. So it's super acidic. Yes. Could be super acidic. It could have uh, VOCs, vol you know, volatile organic compounds in, in there. It could be from what, something they're eating. It could be from some tree that they're rubbing against. We don't know. See, what we don't know is we don't know anything. <laughs> but we're now all aware of it. So I'm hoping that through science, um, everybody coming together on this one topic, getting the word out. Um, getting a hold of um, like one of Shelly Covington, Montana's collection kits that's made just for this particular thing, you know, to invest 10 bucks to have a kit, you know, in your car to at least put, some, you know what I mean? There's things we can do yep. to um, really uh, raise the bar to the point. Every dang scientist, they're not going to be able to deny it anymore. You know, they're going to believe chemical compounds um, more than they are going to believe, you know, a photo or a video or a film. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, I mean, you know, one bit of advice is somebody does find this. Don't don't touch it with your hands. Take take a ton of photos. Get really close ones because you can actually, especially in glass, you can photograph the skin pores, the actual yep. sweat pores. And um, they're actually quite prominent on a Bigfoot. Uh, yep. Then uh, you know, collect it with a, a Q-tip or get get a, get a DNA a proper DNA kit. Collect it, keep it dry. You don't have to freeze it; just put it in a dry envelope. Yep. And don't put it in a plastic baggie because humidity nope. kills <laughs> kills DNA evidence. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Um, so. Uh, uh, right. Let's see. Just uh, checking some of the. Oh, OT asks, uh, do you think there is a conspiracy to keep Bigfoot covered up? I do on a local level, meaning, look, these all these departments, they don't talk to each other. They're all trying to save their skin. Okay. So let's say we have a wildlife science center somewhere in, in Kentucky, Chris. Let's say they have a Bigfoot sighting. Do you really think they're going to go to their boss at, at the county or at the county or the city level and tell them what they saw? Hell no. No. Not going to. So let's say the, the people at the sightings, boss is a sighting. Do you think they're going to go to bring it up at their next board meeting? No. Mm. So there's your cover up. 
it just happens naturally. People being um, uh, wanting to save their own skin, you know, preserve yeah. their own job. So that yeah. picture that now times level after level after level after level after level after level. Are you ever going to get to the truth? You'd have to go direct to the top. But the problem is no one's feeding the top. And so then if the top did go out on their own to gather their own evidence, they're not sharing it with the lower guys. Right. Yeah. So you and, do a FOIA request and they don't have anything, even though they damn well might have a body or know exactly what these are. I know the military has been involved. I've heard too many stories, you know, where the military has showed up um, right after a really amazing sighting as if they were kind of pre-warned or they already knew there was some activity. It just it doesn't make sense. And I've heard this from people I trust a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, you know, and that, that would explain why Kurt Koga, <laughs> the NCON scientist said, well, if these things existed, people would be seeing them. Well, they are, you know, it's just not getting to you. Yeah. yeah. So it makes a Do lot you guys of sense. agree with me on the, on the levels of the bureaucratic. Oh, oh, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. And I think it's beneficial, especially for like the U S department of interior to look the other way because of, you know, what did the spotted owl do to the logging industry? Oh, exactly. Everybody, yeah. everything. And then eventually you can just say, follow the money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, just well, the engineer where the money comes from. Right. Yeah. Here locally. I mean, we live in, I live in the mammoth cave region of Kentucky. And of course, you know, there's lots of guys over there that are Rangers and stuff and they like park Rangers. Yep. And that's actually, you know, if you in, if you'd like to work for the government rather than being in politics, that's actually a cushy job yeah. that has great benefits and it pays very well. well if, you, if you like the outdoors, that, that'd be your dream job. So, yeah. So if you're riding around in a park ranger truck or vehicle and old Big and Harry walks out across the road, you know, chances are you're probably not going to say anything because, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it goes beyond the chances. I mm. think, it'd be, oh, my God, it would be one hundredth of one percent of people would ever say a word right no it's not happening i mean i've actually had personal experiences with government officials who have come to me you know in confidence and have told me stories and you know and and it's it's just so obvious and should be to everybody that once i don't care how high up they are if they find something they're not saying nothing Right. They might talk among themselves, you know, you know, Bill might talk to Joe at lunch, but they're definitely going to have a pact that goes, you know, don't tell so-and-so, you know, because we'll lose our jobs or, you know, we'll get, we'll get fired. We'll get demoted, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Brian Goslin took a beating too. Oh my God. Do you think, and... you know, I don't think Brian expected that, you know, to go as far as it did, ended up in that book, as I remember. Yeah. yeah. And the book um, probably didn't sell that many copies, but it got out to his friends. And I know it made Brian's life miserable. Yep. Sure did. Sure did. Well, more questions are popping in. Uh, from, oh, yeah. From Walt, he asked, Do you think there is a Bigfoot UFO connection or a Bigfoot paranormal mm -hmm. connection? Nice Godzilla, by the way, Walt. <laughs> Well, Walt, I don't know. <clears throat> I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit here and go. If there's a no Bigfoot UFO connection, may I blow up? Um, I just, I don't know. I have no idea. What I do know is whatever it is, it's very physical. It's so a let's say it's dimensional or paranormal. It's still physical, right? It's still leaving footprints. Still leaving wow. hair. Still smells. Um, still stinks at times. Um, so if it is paranormal, then by God, then it's a metaphysical, you know, deal. No. Um, I don't think they're driving. I don't think hair would be a thing that uh, would help them drive, uh, you know, UFOs. So I certainly, if anything, if there are any connection between them and UFOs, the UFO occupants are studying them just like we're trying to. Yep. I've always said that. Yeah. You know, why why wouldn't they study them? If they're studying us, they, they have to be well, studying us. Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, there's no there'd be no other reason for them to even be here visiting the earth except to study. Right. Studying everything. Yeah. Um, and why wouldn't you study an eight foot human like 
creature. And I got to admit, I'm pretty amazed at the disclosure in, that's coming out in that phenomenon. Right. You know, lately, which is really, you know, the, the there's been a whole new UFO project. And, yep. you know, now the, even pilots are more openly talking about it, which is really an amazing thing. It kind of makes me wonder that maybe, you know, maybe it, there is hope eventually down the road that we'll be able to talk about this phenomenon a little more openly. Well, if you take, you know, all of the people that claim they're abducted and take the word of of um, doctors that have removed these implants, it, to me, it wouldn't be a huge stretch to go, well, they've found the, the 20 Sasquatches in Pennsylvania and they've got them all tagged. Yeah. 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 Look, we've put radio colors on bears. I've done it myself. It's just not, it's not that weird. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Maybe they're tagged. Uh, next question uh, from OT. Uh, another question in Monster Quest. There was an episode on the Dog Man. What do you think of that possibility? Could it be real? I know our audience kind of has that skepticism about the Dog Man, but yeah, yep. And I've never, <clears throat> I've never seen one. I've never had any personal experience, and I've certainly never examined any evidence. You know, unlike the Bigfoot mystery, there's a ton of evidence. But am I going to say it doesn't exist? No, not at all there's still a lot of really good witnesses, you know? Um, and I just, because I've been a witness numerous times and I know what it feels, I'm not going to dismiss somebody else's sighting. You know, you could be dealing with, I mean, just the name once again, like Bigfoot, dog man, maybe it's not a dog. Maybe it's still an ape, oh. you know? Or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's attached to something else through evolution. Uh, I yeah. don't I Just do. a different uh, facial structure would, would, would give it the label dog man. You know, yeah. it doesn't right. necessarily need to have uh, dog tracks or anything. Well, people, people do mention, you know, that kind of the, uh, the backwards leg, but I don't right. know. You know, I just, I don't know. And so I'm just uh, not, not, not afraid to admit I don't know. I don't know, but I'm not going mean, to. I'm not gonna, uh, but you're so you're so right. There's so little evidence of Dogman, uh, Mothman. Same thing. There, there's zero evidence. You know, when you talk about the Thunderbird, and, and I'll give you a story. My many many years ago, my brother was alive, and my brother is a retired police officer and everything. So very, uh, you know, head on the shoulders type of guy. One day, he's sitting there, and he goes, "I do the Bigfoot stuff." And he says, "I, I got to ask you a question, Steve. You ever heard something about a?" like a huge bird i go yeah it's called a thunderbird why he goes well you know he was driving down to taconic and he saw this thing fly overhead he says the wingspan must have been at least 30 feet you know and but the but the thing about that is why haven't we found any like molted feathers that are like extra large and stuff like that mm -hmm. you know you know, know that that's the stuff that makes me question mark all that that kind of well, stuff well here's here's what's interesting and i'm you know i'm just gonna be totally honest here yeah I, did, once again, had never made a conclusion on Thunderbirds or Mothman or any of this stuff. But one day we were driving home from uh, Cloquet, Minnesota. I don't know how many years ago. Uh, I'm going to guess here, 2008. And we're driving back. Um, clear, clear, beautiful, clear night. Full moon. Pretty cloudless. And we're driving at about maybe 1, 2 in the morning. And I see something, actually me and Yvette both did. It drops down, straight down, just like a spider mm -hmm. dropping on a web and stops. So picture, picture a bird with wings out, outspread. That's maybe 30 foot wingspan, mm -hmm. dropping straight down from the sky without, without folding its wings or going into a stoop. Right, like a falcon would. Yeah. Just open wings, drop straight down. And we're like, what the heck? And all of a sudden, it dropped down to ground level too, Steve and Chris. Wow. And then came right at our windshield. Yeah. Well, I mean, how what it was, I don't know. I didn't catch it. Yeah. All I can tell you this is we ducked when it got yeah. close to the window. <laughs> now, could it have been an owl? Well, yeah, if there's owls with wings that cover the entire width of the freeway, yes. You know, that's just as weird to me. Yeah. So what, 
what did we see? Did we see something that was paranormal? Did we see a physical creature? Were we both just hallucinating just out of the, the blue when we were talking business? We were talking about yeah, sure. anything else. Yeah. It just caught, caught us off guard. But then when I also found other witnesses in Minnesota, then the exact same thing happened to them. Yeah. Very. Uh, Does that mean wow. it exists? Doesn't exist? I don't know. I don't like Very the story. Weird planet we live on. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. that's where I go with this. Yeah. We live, guys. Everybody who's listening to this, we live in a freaking amazing, wonderful world full of mysteries. And if you can't see that, then you're missing over half your life. Yeah. Literally. I mean, just being curious about <coughs> all the. I mean, oh my God, if you're just curious, a mouse has got a million mysteries still that we don't know, <laughs> let alone a Bigfoot, right? Or whatever swooped at my car. Don't know. So there you go. Now, Keith Worley asked a question. Uh, do you know anything about the uh, Bigfoot Mount St. Helens connection? Have you heard or have any? Sure, sure. I've you know, read and heard all sorts of things. Um I'm not sure his question is not that specific, meaning did Bigfoots get killed during the eruption? Was that the question? Probably. Probably. Uh, I Probably. assume so. Yeah. yeah the story, I mean, of, heard, the story of uh, as it goes is that the eruption and then the, yep. the National Guard came in and took the bodies and flew yep. them away. Oh, yeah. All the dead bodies that the government supposedly found and removed. Yeah. He's got a yeah, word comment. Heard the same stories he has, and I have yeah. no other evidence to it. Um, I don't know who in the world from the government would be willing to come come clean on that one. And it doesn't mean that, um, you know, animals, I think a lot of animals did get killed, but I think the smarter ones booked out of there ahead of time. I mean, there was so much warning. You know, really, there were a long, a lot of warning. So it doesn't mean any of them got killed. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing I, I find, too, is that there was people that got killed that were never found. Yep. Um, yes. You know, they're pulverized by the, the, uh, <clears throat> as that ash cloud come down, comes down, and that's not only, that's superheated, that goes right through you, it dices you. So what bodies would there be to take? And then you have the uh, pyroclastic flow. The water and the the, the ash mixture that flowed oh, down. God. So to me, it's always been a doubtful story because if you know how bodies happen to be burned up, pulverized, buried under, you know, you know, tens of feet of debris, you know, the fact that they came in and found all these bodies laying about it sounds kind of like science fiction to me. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. And animals are known for having a uh, uh, some sort of extrasensory perception right. uh, when it comes to to disasters like that. Uh, I remember, uh, let's see, uh, the big uh, tsunami. Uh, it hit. Uh, well, of course, my wife's from Thailand, so I was up on the Thai news happening at the time. And uh, there were some uh, tourists that were on a elephant trekking expedition. There, they were riding on the back of elephants. And, uh, you know, I think it's a pretty good deal. I mean, they're not mean to the elephants. They feed them. The tourists pay money. They get money for food. You know, it works. But anyway, uh, before the tsunami hit the coastline, these elephants took off with the tourists in tow uh, up the mountain. And they're like, they can't get them to stop. They were just were going where they were. When they went up to the, up to the mountain, up to the higher, higher elevations, and then the tsunami hit. Yep, there you go. Oh. There you go. You have an intel well, extremely intelligent animal that flee. You know, they took off. Right. Be and in us as humans, we had no idea that 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 tsunami was going to hit. Right. Now, now let me let me give you a little little science tidbit on that that I'm thinking mm -hmm. is that when an earthquake occurs, which causes the tsunami, um, and the, the tsunami itself. There are certain infrasound type of, of emissions that come from these things. Yes. It's very well known that elephants use infrasound and, can and they can hear, hear infrasound. So they probably felt that blast and said, I'm out. 
And that's what probably now, if we think that a Sasquatch may use infrasound, which they're is very likely, well, they they're going to be able to hear the same thing. Correct. Right. Yeah. So you are, you are dead on with that. You know, it's a good analogy and probably somewhat true. And the question is, you know, though, when did they start booking out of there? Um, if they were hearing that rumbling, they would have they would have left. Yeah. But yeah, especially they, I mean, none of us know. Well, I mean, they had months. You know, they had a couple of months of rumbling on St. Helens to yeah. go. Uh, time to uh, let's pack. Let's pack the bags and head down the mountain. Uh, and I, I happened to go there. Um, I mean, it wasn't terribly. You know, it was. It was early enough where there was still a lot of ash. You know, when we were there. Mm -hmm. And there were still rumblings yeah. from the mountain. I remember watching, you know, the rocks. I remember Rick Knowles pointing it out. Rick Knoll pointing it out, going, "You see all that? Doesn't that look like goats running down the hill?" Right. And I'm looking at him, going, "Yeah, that does look like goats." He goes, "Those are boulders." <laughs> Oops. And I'm thinking, and it was, you know, yeah, there were there was there was a lot of shaking still going on. Yeah, it's it's not like it didn't give its fair warning. Yes, correct. You know, and uh, if people just heeded it, but yep. I, but yep. it became such a, a an attraction. Let's watch it. Yeah, and yep. Uh, <coughs> you know, unfortunately, those geological guys, you know, they were right. there for science, and they were, I think, so addicted to it that it caused their own, own undoing as well. Yep. Um, you, Steve, did you see that post? And I wanted to get something out today because I know you get a lot, plenty of people that listen to this on getting a using a motorcycle dash cam in not only their car but their tent when they're camping. Did you did you see the post I put up on that? I have not. I was I was at work all day today, okay. so I kind of. So a motorcycle dash cam, they're very inexpensive. They're, you know, a little over a hundred bucks. They have two small waterproof cameras, small waterproof color monitor, long cords that come off them. And you can, and I put a link up, you can run them off a little tiny phone power bank. Oh, wow. So now you can have a dash cam on your car while you're driving in these Bigfoot areas. So now you get to your spot, you can grab the camera, clip the cameras on your clothing, on you know, one in the backpack, maybe one in the front, and they record all the time. They never stop recording. You don't have to remember to turn it on. You don't have to remember the settings. It's also recording audio automatically. But you're getting footage from two cameras. Hmm. That's an important, this is kind of an important tip because... You know, it's kind of a pain to bring all these this gear and all these cameras, and and then you don't have a dash cam in your car. Yeah. 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 So it kills everything. You camp at night, so now you run the cameras outside your tent. So no more of this. Oh, I heard something walking around my yeah. tent. Because you can, you don't even have to turn it on. Flip over your monitor, and there's going to be whatever's walking around your yeah. tent, and yeah. it's going to be recording. So you don't even have to remember to record. And I just yeah, this pretty. Is yeah. Kind of a needed, you know, to adapt this inexpensive technology to anybody doing research. It's like a godsend because it's dummy proof. You give it power, it's on, it's recording both cameras. I know a few, a couple of my friends, they, they have these uh, cheap uh, interior cameras. So if it's not raining out, they'll put them up around the tent and they can mobile hotspot them to sure. their phone or to yes. whatever so they can go oh, what's that so yeah i mean the technology is out there though, but that motorcycle i'm going to check that out yeah the reason I, the, the reason the motorcycle is so cool because everything's exposed on a motorcycle so, so every waterproof, waterproof. Yeah. and you get separate two little cameras that you can hide i mean you could use this as a uh, temporary game trail camera as long as it's got power it's going to keep recording and I think they'll hold up to 256 gigs. So that's Ooh, a lot that's of footage. And then when it's full, it'll just buffer. But then there's a you know a button you can just lock it. But I just thought, oh man, this has got to get out to everybody. That is, I'm gonna check that out. Yep. Another yep. another toy in the bag. <laughs> yep. the link, I did put a link on my Facebook page. So okay, so we got a couple of quite we got a few more. We got a few oh, more questions popping up there. 
uh, you know, Walt asked if uh, Monster Quest ever do anything about the Raystown Ray. I don't recall that. It was a similar to Champ, but it's located in Raystown, Pennsylvania. I don't think there was an episode of that. No, no, no. Um, <clears throat> Uh, does Doug think they live in swamps or underground? Um, neither. There you go. Yeah, I, I think they live in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, I think some could live in a swamp. They could take yeah. cover in a swamp. But they live anywhere there's woods, water, and hills. Yeah. You know, if you get two of them, you're probably okay. They're probably going to be there. But I don't think they're – so many people think they're underground – like, okay, if you even take any of the fossils they find in caves, they find them there because porcupines dragged them in. Yeah. It wasn't, Wonderful. There's not a Very lot of people know that, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they don't live in there. I mean, caves are not the best place to live. Right. Although, yes, they can offer shelter temporarily, and Bigfoots could certainly use caves, sewer systems, culverts. Um. Uh, Jesus had a great story he told me the other day about people that have actually had sightings in, you know, these big sewer systems. You know, homeless people have mentioned seeing them. So, yeah, they're going to utilize anything that's there. If it's a cave, it's big, they're going to utilize it. If, it's, if it offers something, but do they need shelter? I don't think so. Yeah, I, I always said that. I didn't think that a Bigfoot would, like, cave up because – if they would, wouldn't somebody run into one or run into a bunch of them in the cave or there'd be some sort of evidence. Well, when was the last time you saw a deer in a cave? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I will say this, and I, I did tell Jesus this story when he was on the show a few, a couple of weeks back is that I was in um, Skinwalker cave uh, down in New Mexico. And there've been a lot of sightings down in uh, lower fruitland, uh, people seeing them in their cornfields quite a bit. And uh, this cave isn't too far from lower fruitland. And as we pull in, there's actually a full body. It looks like a full body impression. It was about seven, eight foot tall on the side of the hill, like something had laid there. Wow. Um, so I was like that, that took my interest into it. But as we go into the cave and the interesting thing, it had a smaller opening on the backside of it. So it was a cave that if somebody came in one way, you could go out the other. Um, but in that cave, we found uh, shucked corn husks. Uh, the shucks and all. I mean, the, the, it was peeled out and it was eaten. And right. they were lay, laying in the cave, which was very bizarre mm -hmm. because there was no corn anywhere near there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was a few miles to lower fruit. With, how did it get there? You know, and there was no birds in the cave or anything silly like that. And plus, we're talking a lot, probably about five or six years. So interesting stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't a Bigfoot use a cave? But mm -hmm. but people always go, well, that's why we don't see them. They're all living in caves. No, mm -hmm. not a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's possible they may use one like for a temporary shelter, like a, a Motel 6 or something. <laughs> sure, if there's one in the area, sure. Why hey. Um. Ah, uh, what else? Well, I've got, I've got I've got one more story. I just want to tell. Yeah, yeah. Just to get people thinking about caves. So back in the day, I did a bunch of spelunking down in Belize in the jungles. I actually, went into a whole bunch of unexplored caves that had never been explored by anybody. And I went down there. I was with the uh, the Ministry of Archaeology. I was with a special forces guy. Um, we went deep into some of these caves and we'd get to the end. In many cases, we were looking for human remains, not because they lived there, but because some, they were placed there because, you know, they, they, they called it Shabalba, you know, which means basically hell, you know, that's the way humans view caves, <laughs> early yeah. humans viewed caves. And they were afraid of caves. Yep. And so, yeah, we did find human remains, but that's because they were brought there, sacrificed, or whatever. They didn't live in caves. Pottery you find in caves. It's not because people live there. It's because it was brought there as a, to keep hell away from them, you know? Yep. So, there you go. Yeah, I mean, we... Um... I mean, even chimps and gorillas, they, they avoid caves, you know? Of course. Uh, yeah, they just avoid them. 
Um, I think many, uh, many early cultures viewed uh, caves as a, a passageway to the underground, you know, the, uh, the yeah. underworld. The underworld, correct. Yeah. Uh, and, and think about it. You know, the lighting's bad in them. Um, there's dampness to them. It's um, well because uh, no, because no animals use caves. Yeah. There's certainly no really delicious edible animals except bats, and yeah. you're not yeah. going to go into a cave to hunt. Yeah, you know, so you're not going to find resources. You're not going to find light. There's not really any nutrition. There's a lot of things to bang your head on, kill you. Um, it's damp and moldy and, you know, God knows what else. But temporarily at the opening or something for a shelter, sure. Yep. Cool in the summer. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, damn it, true. yeah, it's true. And, and those those corn husks, they weren't deep into the cave. They were right. actually closer to the, like yes. something that just ducked in there to take a little cover, eat, and yep. Yep. move on out. Well, uh, that, you know, that's funny because there's all, all kinds of reports. Uh, seeing these creatures load up in cornfields, you know, just really r rick up the, the corn, pulling it off the stalk. You know, speaking of dogmen, the, the most interesting thing about that whole phenomena is that most sightings take place near cornfields. Yeah. Nobody yeah. ever thinks about that. I mean, you can take a map. I don't care how many dogmen sightings. You're going to find a cornfield within, in most cases, 500 yards. Hmm. And it's like, well, what's the connection? Dogs don't eat corn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd always thought or, you know, wondered if the dog man could be a misidentification. Uh, not intentionally, you know, yeah. but. Uh, well, for years, I mean, you think about it, they used to call Sasquatch bear men because they thought they were bears, right. you know. Yeah. And, or, uh, you know, so. Um, you know, just uh, very. Uh, I I I take this this stretch that you know the dogman is really a tough one for me to swallow because, you know, for a dog to be bipedal, um, doesn't make a lot of sense. The structure of their legs, uh, yeah, don't make a lot of sense. That's it. <clears throat> you wouldn't expect a you know, um, something like that. Now somebody might argue and say, well, they don't walk on their their hind legs all the time. That that's probably only you know certain times, but. I, I don't know. It's it's bizarre to me, um, and I think that in a lot of cases we're misidentifying a Sasquatch or something else. Yeah. You know, they may be misidentifying. That may be your true misidentification of perhaps a moose or an elk or something like that in that case because of the snout. I've, so got, I, yeah. I've got a question for you guys. Are you thinking like I do that Bigfoot spend more time on all fours? Than most people think about, or are you? Have you, you know, uh, even thought about it? I well, I I came up with a very interesting uh, idea when I actually was when I was out in the Four Corners area because I had seen some evidence of it. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I we brought this up a little while back, uh, a couple shows ago. Uh, I was in T Snows Post, Arizona, and uh, one of the uh, the folks had seen. Uh, something had, out in the distance, there was a street or a road and there was a light and something had crossed the light, you know, go across and kind of blacked it out for a second. So it had to be pretty tall. So the, the guy with the camera was like, I think you better get your night vision equipment out, Steve. So I walk around the far side of the truck and I open up the truck door and then behind me, maybe 12 feet at best, I hear this, you know, this big rustle and, and movement to the point where I wasn't sure if it was coming towards me or away from me. I drew my knife, I spun around and, you know, we hear this, all this commotion and then I could pick up, it was going away from me. The next morning when daylight hit, we, we looked around in the, in the sand and we found what looked like large impressions. I mean, there was no, you know, uh, solid footprints. It was very loose grain sand. Um, but then follow up to that were like these half type of impressions. Now I have this thought theory that if they go on a four by four mode, as only people, and I think it, that's what it did. It sounded like to me, it just dropped and went because it sounded it, for a second. It sounded like it was bipedal, but then it went to like a, a quadrupedal type of hauling off. Um, and we found like 
these almost like knuckle prints almost and these like half prints but no full things but we had a couple in the initial stages where they were larger so what i think it is is that the you have the mid tarsal break on the feet and i think when they go in the four by four mode their heels come up so when they're doing the four by four mode the only the front part from the, the 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 dermal ridge going forward is only making contact with the ground. So that will cause these little smaller tracks. Well, I've talked to, I've recently talked to some witnesses <clears throat> that have seen them on tippy toes, basically spider mode, walking on fingers, literally suspend, you know, fingers lifting their weight and toes lifting their weight with their hands and arms spread and their legs spread witnessed by multiple witnesses. And so I'm like, uh, I mean, is this one of the reasons these tracks could sort of disappear and, you know, in the forest at times, that's a real good point too. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody may, you know, there, there are times like, like I've heard stories of snow tracks that disappear and I turn around and I think, you know, I think people may be misidentifying snow tracks. Snow tracks, unless they're really fresh in there, I, I take with a big grain of salt because I've mm. seen deer track. And in fact, I even uh, a couple of years ago on one of my blogs, on my blog, I actually put, I took a picture of this print. What does this look like to you? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It was actually my, my the guy that did the lawn stepped in the snow. And fast forward one week, and now it looks like a Bigfoot print. No. You know, <laughs> um, and I've seen deer print. Do I've seen deers, especially bounding deers, where people say, oh, look at the stride on this thing. It's like six feet. No, it's a bounding deer. Yep. That's what it is. Um, and uh, there, there's no there's no left-right delineation, which, uh, you know, people will show me tracks that are right in line with one another. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm going, well, it's a bipedal creature. There's got to be some delineation a little bit. Yeah. You know, you, you, you know, it's not walking a tightrope as it walks. It's Well, I, I really think the, uh, the, you know, the quad walking, the witnesses, hasn't really been covered on any documentaries. No. It hasn't really been studied scientifically how they might do it what advantages it would give them. So it's one of the, one of the pieces of content that I really want to get into in a, in a new show. Uh, that, that would explain the phenomena of people getting partial tracks, uh, like the front of the foot. Sure. Yep. Hmm. It's uh, interesting. It, it is, is interesting, but there's also, you know, trunk grabbing too. I've, you know, seen that from, um, uh, what is it? I think it's, I don't know. If, I don't know if the footage is real. I have no way of knowing, a hundred percent. But it's the Russian Yeti. Footage. Oh yes, yes. No. And you see this huge arm span, but you see it grab a tree trunk and basically propel itself forward. Right. No, at least once. So either that CG, which I don't think it is, or it's a guy in a costume, which it can't be. It doesn't look like CG, and so if it is CG, and they've they've got me fooled. Certainly, there's no way it could be a guy in a costume. And yeah, it would be uh, also would be biologically correct for uh, the creature to use his muscles, both upper and lower body, to accelerate to move sure. away, right? Uh, yep. To get to, get up to speed as quickly as possible. Yep, I've never tried a maneuver like that. Um, Except maybe when I was an eight-year-old kid, but grabbing a pole and swinging right. from it. I'm, I'm yeah. sure I did that when I was a kid. I don't know how much it helped, but um, it's it's things like this. That, you know, they're worth studying. They're worth looking into, thinking about, um, trying to jog your brain on anything you've seen or anything you've done. So this is the Russian Yeti video that I pulled up real quick. No, not this one. Oh, not this one? Nope. Oh, this is the road crossing one, I think. Um, this is the one where they go back the, and you see the okay. arm swing. Nope, this isn't. No. That is the one you're talking Okay. No. No, it's, um. gosh. I'm big. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Um, 
uh, type in just type in Russian Bigfoot, and it's it's it takes place in a forest. There's two children with a dog, and they're speaking Russian. Oh, hang on. I'm gonna have yeah. I can't find it really. Uh, uh, that's <laughs> well. Why don't you do this? I'll send you a link, and you can play it in your next show next week. That, that would be yeah. That, that would be good. Uh, yeah, we appreciate that, Doug. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I've seen I, that clip. I, I, you're I talking Russian about. Yeti, and I get the white one walking across the road like eighty times, and <laughs> I get the uh, yeah. No, this one I've analyzed quite a bit, but remember, I don't have the original footage. Oh. At this point, I have no. There's been no response. It's just uh, you know, the video is either extremely valuable, or it's just a complete hoax. But I'm not sure how they did it. Yep. It's a hoax. Yeah, I I don't know if you've looked at the the car one that I, I put up there. That was pretty interesting to me. Yes, but it's so blurry. Yeah, so, so far away that it's worthless. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I agree. It's just interesting, but the Russian one actually that I speak of, there's some scientific value there. Yeah. So, it's yeah, not, it's not all that blurry. It's there's a good part of it where there's no tree cover. So there can actually be things that can be, um, you know, looked at by scientists. So, but it's been, it's been highly ignored, and because of where it first appeared, what is that? NVTV is that? Right. Yeah. No, all I know is I, I have to look at it at face value. I, I see no. In, I'm not. I'm not the world's best ex expert on CG, but Lord knows, I've sure done a lot of it. <laughs> I love those little Monster Quest uh, apes and stuff, the uh, Bigfoot creatures you had. It was, <laughs> it was so cool. Now, and I can tell you that hair is probably one of the hardest things to do because you have uh, to put a gravity marker on every hair. Right. So, uh, yeah, I type in Russian Bigfoot, even uh, uh, NVTV, and they want to give me the Datloff Pass Bigfoot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, have, you, have you guys noticed, like I've noticed, that YouTube has destroyed its search engine on maybe purpose? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> because I've typed in, like, I'll type in a phrase that I want, and the same 20 videos come up. And I type in another for your same 20 videos. Yeah. <laughs> Where in the past, it would be more specific. Right. They have become very algorithmic. It's like they're and, pushing yeah. certain videos they want you to see, and that's the end of it. Yeah. Well, if they get if you get a lot, and, and this is just a reminder, folks, you want us to come up in the search engine a little bit more, make sure you hit the like button. Um, or if you, you think we suck, you can hit the down <laughs> the thumbs down too. Um, <laughs> but um we, we sure hope you do give us the thumbs up because that yeah. helps with the algorithms is actually the it number does. of likes and yeah <coughs> just so, like when people, so people start, can find us in the search and comments and comments you know so after yeah. the show is done let us know what yeah. you thought of the show let us know you know hey we need to have this guest back on again you know let us know those yeah. things because those comments and the, the the thumbs and interactions all help us propagating the algorithm and that way when when Doug searches the next time will come up <laughs> mm -hmm. so um wow so um very cool um well we're kind of winding the show down we got like 15 minutes left so and no I, <laughs> that was my reminder we got 15 minutes left and let's see what the news flash is oh that was tax sending me the video of the russian bigfoot on my phone which not gonna do me any good um <laughs> Well, Doug, uh, if you get into the film business, I would sure love to see, and I'm sure a lot of other Bigfoot enthusiasts would love to see something done on the Albert Ostman story. Uh, I would like to see a, a full-length film made yeah. of that. Yeah. Uh, just an idea. I'd throw it out there in case anybody's listening. <laughs> it, it, actually, it would, make, it would make a great film. Mm -hmm. um, it would make the great basis for a film, but a lot would have to be fictionalized, you know, because... The actual story and the content that Albert gave everybody, right. it's not that much information. Right. Not a ton, you know. Yeah. We all know the story, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an interesting story, and I don't know what to think, but here's my take on that story. He did mention 
something he called the goose walk. When I heard or read that in his writings, I got chills because those were the same words I used. Bad quality video film somewhere. Oh, Steve. <laughs> Sorry, I'm. <laughs> I can't get this thing to play with. I can't get this thing to mute. Yeah. No, that's fine. But anyhow, um, what was I saying, Chris? I, the goose walk. Yeah, the yeah, goose, the walk. goose walk. Yeah. I got goosebumps because literally I was trying to find a word to describe the way um, Patty walks, mm -hmm. you know, with the in and out, in and out, right. in and out. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way he would have known that if he had not observed a creature at the very least in his life. Right. So at the very least, he had a damn good sighting. Yeah, that was, uh, let's see, 1957. I think that was 10 years prior to the Patterson-Gimlin film, so he had never seen that. Well, yeah, he didn't know. The actual Osman story, I think, happened in the 20s. 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was talking about the... Yeah, the, the Osman story happened in 24. He didn't come out, I think, until yeah. 57. Yeah, the, the interview. Right, right, right. You're, you're right, Chris. He didn't come forward with it. Yeah. But very interesting. I've always liked that one, and it was... Mainly, you know, as a biologist, I was interested in the stuff he described about uh, them uh, gathering uh, the sweet grasses and eating the roots. Yeah, yeah, so now, that makes perfect yeah, sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of, there were some subtle details in the story yeah. that gave me chills. But then there was other things that I just thought, God, it's just, yeah, you know, the snuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, I thought the same thing with the Jacko story. Yeah. There was there was a subtle thing about the twisting of the branches. Right. Yeah. Yep. You know, that I thought was was kind of fascinating. Um and uh, you know, we gotta you know, we're gonna get we gotta get Tom Steenberg back on here to talk about the because he did the whole thing right there. He actually went to the spot allegedly where they found Jacko and all of the actually found the tunnel and all that. Um, and, and just so folks know too, I'm uh, right now I'm working for the channel. I'm working on doing a, uh, a classics, uh, Squatch Stories, the classics. And I'm going to be breaking down the Osman story and Mullicat Harry and William B. Rowe and all those stories of the past and get them up for video and recounting those. So um, that's one of the things on the on the thing. Very so, cool. so Doug, what do you have on the old uh, platform going forward? You're still trying to, obviously you're trying to get the, uh, you've been doing a lot about um, giving people ideas. It's good to see you back out circulating quite vigorously. Yeah. Um, and I, I wasn't on social media for 15 years yeah. and decided, well, okay, I'm going to join it. Cause I started this um, uh, podcast with Joel Sturgis untold radio. AM, we do have a great, you know, we have a, we have a website and, and, um, you can't get guests. It's pretty tough to without Facebook. So that's yeah. how it started. And then after I, I joined it, I realized, oh my goodness, look at all the research groups on here. Yeah. Look at all the data coming in. And so I realized you guys are first to get all the data. So then I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. <laughs> And I just didn't, you know, it's funny. I never heard anything good about Monster Quest. You wow. Know, nice spell to communicate, you know, with a few people. We loved it. Yeah. Oh, we, yeah. We thought everybody hated it. No. We, I, I remember the uh, I remember the scuttlebutt on social media with, oh, there's no more Monster Quest. It was I, like, man, I, I still watch. I love the reruns. I love the reruns. Yeah. If, it was and, like, you know, you mentioned that Lake Trout episode. That was one of my favorites too. I really liked the Lake Trout episode. You know, and, and truthfully, uh, people loved Monster Quest over Finding Bigfoot. I think the researcher, the research people did. We thought it was more of a, you know, I don't think you realized the the bar you had set. Yeah. That when Monster Quest came out, that set the bar for everything following it. That it, none of the other shows really lived up to that. Yeah. yeah, um, you know, uh, you know, I hate to say it, you know, uh, hey, I, you know, I, I know Matt and Cliff and Bobo, uh, very well, and you know, I'm sorry, you know, Monster Quest was a very seriously, you know, serious minded program, 
Well, and yeah, we tried to do a little more science. Um, yep. It all depends on really who your boss is. Yep. You yeah. Know, yeah. Cliff and Matt only have so much pull. Anyway, yeah. I agree. And, and God, they are, you know, think about how lucky they are. <laughs> well, to be able if, to at least get out there and meet people, um, yeah. go into new geographic areas, talk to people, yeah. um, do a little research. I mean, it's a dream job. Right. right. And I, I'm just talking strictly from the research aspect. You know, the researchers really love the monster quest yeah. program versus the rest. Yeah. Yeah. I could I could look at finding Bigfoot and parse the, the entertainment with what was going on. Yeah. Um, you know, being, you know, involved with so many different shows over the years. Uh, one quick question, too, is from Tack again. How did uh, you come up with the new facial reconstruction of Patty? Um... Boy, that's a long. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, of course, Mike's gotta ask this with eight minutes. First left off, it's not new. That's the first yeah. thing. It's old. It's just I posted it, so it's once again new to people. So I've done things God, twenty years ago that are gonna I'm gonna be releasing that are gonna be totally fresh to people. They're gonna think it's all new, but it's basically using a point to point to point. Because there's enough information in the Patterson footage to give us um, the facial reconstruction, then it's only, you know, once you know anatomy, you know, you you know how to remove hair. Hair is not difficult to remove off a creature, nor a gorilla. You know, there's just certain depths. Don't, that you I, have. don't I know it? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so if you gave me a picture of you with that hat on, I could easily through technology, remove it, you know, <laughs> probably recreate the exact dimensions of your head. And so everything's just, you know, it's just simple math and, and 3D technology because then once you get something in a 2D world, then you can rotate it. That was on the, wasn't some of that on the uh, DVD extras of Legend Meet Science? Not on the facial reconstruction. Um, there's a number of things in there. There is the 3D... Um, walking if anybody wants to right. really see what is going on with the patterson creature from the back yeah. and from the from from the front and the back which is the part you cannot see right you, you watch patty walking you only get to enjoy it from the side and you think oh boy that walks just like a human heck no it's not even close to a human. Right. and you don't notice it until you get it from the back or the front and yeah. that's what we do you know, there it, are a lot of. It is lot. completely different from the foot placement to the the oh, length of the yeah. shin. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean it's walking on a tightrope, but how does it get to that? How does it get to that um, that position without tipping over? Right. Yeah. And and how does it get there in an in efficient? How does it get there? And so what you do is you reconstruct everything, and then you have to see: Does this make sense in the physical world? Is this efficient? When we run our algorithms, you know, in the animation, there's yeah. so much that the Patterson footage has yet to tell us. People think, oh, it's a guy in a suit. No, it's not a guy in a suit. Yeah. And that, that footage is going to be studied. Um, now um, I'm planning on some artificial intelligence things because literally AI has gotten to the point where it can tell us whether that creature is real at this point. Wow. Okay, yeah, that would. I mean, think about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, wow, well, this has been an incredible journey. I learned a lot today. And again, Doug, I want to thank you for all the stuff you've done. Um, if you don't think you've made a mark in, in this this field, uh, you certainly have. Well, it's great to hear it. Sorry. Um, great to hear it. I mean, I've been. Um, hearing a lot of nice things, which is nice because, like I said, I've never had any feedback. Yeah, and like I said, when those, I mean, this stuff started coming out just before I started getting into research, mm -hmm. and it inspired me to get into it as well. It was oh, very cool. kind of more of a push, um, you know, that and then finding out that hey, you know, Bigfoot's in my neck of the woods up in Whitehall, and between that stuff. And, and and your stuff really gave me the hey I got to get involved. This is 
my investigative background. I had to do it. Had to do it. I wanted to see if this was yeah. really going on. And un unbelievable. And we didn't even get to talk about everything. I wanted to get into Freeman a little bit too, but um let's do, do it again, Steve. Can't do it yeah. in an hour or two or yeah. whatever we had here. Seemed we, like 20 minutes to me. Yeah, there a couple hours went. Whew. It's that been a wonderful two, conversation. That yeah. was two hours, Chris. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel the same way, Doug. It, time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, and, uh, no, it's, you've been a great guest, and it's been an honor having you. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Steve. Good seeing you again. Oh, same here. Well, it's been too long. Amen to that, Will. Hopefully it'll be soon. And I know people are asking, you know, is Monster Quest coming back? But you've already said you're trying, so... Well, we're trying to get. I don't know if it'll be called Monster Quest, but right. uh, but I'm yes, I am working on in getting involved and in, in um, producing films. And the website we can catch your podcast in as well. Yes, correct. Yep. Okay. And that's uh, untoldradioam.com. Untoldradioam.com. Yep. Okay, yep. awesome. So, folks, uh, again, it's ten fifty-seven. Chris, you want to well, say your. Uh, once again, I, I want to thank Doug for uh, coming on. It's been such a great guest. And uh, thank our lovely, wonderful audience. You guys are so smart. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of each and every one of you. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody watching us on YouTube, if this is the first time, uh, please hit the subscribe, like, share, ring the bell, do all, leave, leave a comment. You know, um, uh, it helps us with the search algorithm. You know, help us. We're not, we don't do paid search Pro, uh, promotions or anything so it really helps us out well folks on behalf of uh, everybody here at again i want to thank doug for coming on well we, we got to have you on sometime soon because yep. continue this conversation it's been, been phenomenal um you know it, what i love about it is this it's very simple yeah uh, you know you're not just a a a producer and creator of these programs but you are you're invested in the research and I love that. And that, that is what makes the difference between this pro your programs and all others. I'm humbly, like. I'm humbly passionate about it. And that's all I can say. So, Thanks, okay. Steve. Okay. Folks, we will be back here next Sunday night, 9 PM Eastern. Um, you know, I, I hope everybody's dealing with the jet lag. Okay. For springing ahead. And uh, hopefully next week it'll be a little bit warmer. And uh, this is the last show of winter, Chris. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Because the, yeah, the 20th, we click to spring. So next week will be the first show of spring. And you know what spring means? It means squatching season. Oh, yeah. Antics. We, yes. <laughs> antics. <laughs> Not and ticks. Antics. Oh, antics. Yeah. Antics. Uh, so, folks, on uh, behalf of everybody here at Squatch DTV, we want to wish everybody a happy, healthy, and safe week. Remember, mask up, keep your social distancing. Until we get through this crap, hopefully it'll be done with by fall. And, again, uh, if you can get your shot, get your shot. And, um, folks, we want to wish everybody a good week. Stay healthy. God bless. Keep on squatching. We'll catch you all here next week, Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern. The whole time, the whole You've been You've watching, been watching Squatch DTV. Join us each week, Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, for the latest on the Bigfoot mystery. As always, we thank you for being our loyal viewers and encourage all to subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Steve Culls. As always, have a great week. Stay safe. God bless. And keep on squatching.